So I'm back with yet another video. I'm back in my recording space. We have power in the recording space. So I thought I would do a very quick video for you guys. So I thought I would start doing some topics of anemia on the channel because I neglected that only because it's a very, very huge topic. And I thought maybe I should break it down into smaller sections so that we can cover it. And then when we're done with it, I can give you an overview at the end. So grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at iron deficiency anemia. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon so you can never be missing such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your bit, and let's go. So now, remember that iron deficiency anemia is falling under the bracket of microcytic anemia. This is not really just a general lecture on anemia, but I'm just zeroing in and focusing much on iron deficiency anemia. So I'm not going to be expecting you to expect me to tell you about indices and what uh, the classification is, but we'll jump right straight into iron deficiency. Now, before getting into any details of this, I want you to remember that this is a type of microcytic anemia. And whenever I want you to think of microcytic anemia, I want you to think of hemoglobin. Remember that hemoglobin is this protein that is going to be found in the red blood cells that is going to be carrying oxygen. And this hemoglobin is going to be made up of two parts. It's going to be made up of a heme, which is consisting of iron and a protoporphyrin ring, and a globin chain, four globin chains, two alpha chains and two beta chains. So if there's a problem with any of these constituents, it can potentially lead to a type of anemia that's known as microcytic anemia. What are these problems? If there's a problem with the iron in the formation of heme, Maybe someone has an iron deficiency, maybe someone has an anemia of chronic disease, because remember when there's an inflammatory process in the body or there's an infection, iron is going to be stored away from the bloodstream. So there's going to be very little iron for the process of erythropoiesis. So generally this leads to microcytic anemia. On the other end of the spectrum, if you have a deficiency in some enzymes that are needed in synthesis of the protoporphyrin ring, enzymes like aminolevolonic acid synthetase and aminolevolonic acid dehydrogenase, ALAS and ALAD respectively, you can have what is known as sideroblastic anemia. Then of course, if there's a problem with the globin chains, either the alpha chain or the beta chain, you develop what is known as thalassemias. So generally your microcytic anemias are of four types, iron deficiency, anemia of chronic disease, especially in the late phase, sideroblastic anemia and thalassemias. So remember that because you don't have enough hemoglobin inside the red blood cells, it's like they undergo an extra division and they become smaller than they are supposed to be such that they maintain that concentration of hemoglobin that is reduced in the cell to keep the cell nice and pink. So generally your MCV is going to be between 80 to 100 femtoliters, but usually some labs will give you 80 to 96. So generally in microcytic types of anemia, it will be less than 80 femtoliters. In terms of iron deficiency anemia, it's the most common type of anemia worldwide, which is why I wanted to start with it. And generally, it's going to be seen in people that are having their iron stores being depleted and they become inadequate to actually sustain normal red blood cell synthesis. It can be either due to decreased levels of iron and then these decreased levels of iron will cause a decrease in the synthesis of heme and ultimately a decrease in hemoglobin, therefore resulting in a microcytic type of anemia. And remember that iron deficiency on its own is not a diagnosis. It must always be secondary to something. Just like anemia itself is not a diagnosis, you must always have a secondary cause. For example, someone who have anemia, what type of anemia do they have? They have a microcytic hypochromic. What type of microcytic hypochromic anemia do they have? They have iron deficiency anemia. What is causing the iron deficiency? Is it maybe prolonged menses? Is it maybe this person is having some hookworm infestation or what else could be causing the iron deficiency? Now, before we go into any details, I wanted us to talk a little bit about iron metabolism. Remember that you need about 10 to, or rather 10 to 30 milligrams of iron are going to be ingested in a day and about 5 to 10 of percent of this are going to be absorbed and very little amounts are lost in uh, about one milligrams. And remember that aside from the females that have these menses, men actually have no way of getting rid of that iron. So if you have that iron overload, there's literally very little ways of actually getting rid of it unless if you cut yourself and you bleed. And the absorption is going to increase to about 20 to 30% in those that have iron deficiency and in pregnancy because the demands increase. 
when the amount can actually even increase up to five folds in patients that have iron depletion or those who have erythropoiesis that has been accelerated. Remember that iron could be derived from animal products or it could be derived from vegetables, non-animal products. So the vegetable derived and even cereals that are fortified with iron. So it means that there are two types of heme that you could possibly get. One that's coming from the meat, which we call heme, and one that's coming from vegetables, which you call non-heme. And if you were to guess, obviously the heme is going to be absorbed much better than the non-heme. So the heme is going to be absorbed in the duodenum and the non-heme is going to be absorbed in the proximal jejunum. There are some transporters that are needed for this. For the heme, there's what is known as the heme carrier protein 1. And then for the non-heme, you have a divalent metal uh, transporter 1 or the DMT1 transporters. So this heme is going to be readily absorbed, the one that's derived from the meat. And remember that ion that is bound to this same heme complex can be found in two states. It can be found in the ferrous form, which is Fe2+, or it can be found in the ferric form, which is Fe3+, which is why the acid in your stomach is very important because the acid in your stomach is going to keep the iron in the reduced form. So it's going to keep it in the ferrous form than in the ferric form. And remember that the ferrous form is much more easy to absorb compared to the ferric form. So you're going to absorb a lot of this iron when there's a lot of acid. So it means that if you give someone potentially a proton pump inhibitor and reduce the acidity, or if someone has gone for an operation and they have had a gastrectomy and the acidity has reduced, potentially they could develop an iron deficiency because that iron will be in the ferric form and ferric form is not so easy to absorb. Ascorbic acid or vitamin C, even citrates also facilitate the absorption. And things that limit the absorption are things like phosphates, oxalates, tannates, which are found in tea, and pyrates, which are found in some plant foods. So generally, inside out the gut, this ion is pretty much going to be bound or rather enter into the gut via a channel that's known as ferroportin. And then once it enters into the bloodstream, it's going to be bound to another protein, which is known as transferrin. This transferrin actually transfers ion to the reticular endothelial system for the process of erythro. Uh, poesis and recycling of the iron. So it transfers it to the liver, it transfers it to the bone marrow where it's stored. And remember that it can be stored in two main forms. It can be stored as ferritin, which is another protein, which is the storage form, or it could be depositing in the tissues as hemosiderin. Once it deposits in the tissues as hemosiderin, it's considered as lost. So most of it is going to be stored as ferritin, two thirds of it, and one third is going to be stored as hemosiderin. So the ferritin, like I said, is this water soluble complex that consists of the iron itself bound to a protein. It is more easy to mobilize this, this ferritin than the hemosiderin actually. So it's the one that's present even in small amounts in the plasma. We can use the levels of transferrin, we can use the levels of ferritin, we can use the levels of iron in the blood to actually judge what type of anemia someone has, something that we refer to as ion studies. I'll explain that a bit later on in this particular video. Remember that the hemosiderin is this insoluble ion protein complex that's found in macrophages in the bone marrow, in the liver, and in the spleen. And like I said, uh, unlike with the ferritin, it's quite visible by light microscopy in the tissue sections in the bone marrow films after you stain it by Perl's reactions. So what are some of the stages of iron deficiency? I like to think of it like this. Suppose you have a job. You're getting money, you're saving money up somewhere. Once you get fired from that job, your expenses will still be there. You stop receiving money. So the money that you have in hand, you're going to spend it. And once now you spend that money that you have in hand, the next thing that you're going to go is now you enter into your storage sites, you use up that storage sites. You try and ask for people to borrow you money. They will lend you some money to somewhat keep you afloat. Eventually even that will run out and then you are in a disaster. So in the first stage, you're going to use up the, uh, the, the storage sites. They are going to be depleted. So generally the ferritin is going to decrease because remember that ferritin is the storage form of iron. So the levels of ferritin will reduce. Remember that this body doesn't have iron. What is it going to do? Create more proteins that are meant to mobilize iron. So the, the transferring molecules are going to increase in amount so that you can mobilize the iron. So the total binding capacity of iron is going to increase. Then generally, the serum iron is eventually also going to deplete. The iron saturation is going to deplete because now, even though you're making a lot of these transferring molecules, they're not going to be bound to iron because there's no iron in the body. So generally, there's going to be a depletion. Eventually, there'll be a normocytic type of anemia because the bone marrow will make fewer but normal-sized red blood cells. Uh, it's iron deficient uh, erythropoiesis that's happening and eventually to start making fewer and smaller red blood cells. So you have this microcytic hypochromic type of anemia.
What are some of the causes? It could be poor diet. Remember infants, breast milk is very little amounts of iron. So especially if you delay to actually introduce the complementary feeds, they may develop iron deficiency anemia. Children that have a poor diet. Other causes like malnutrition, which is a very big cause. Remember in the management of malnutrition, we often give them iron specifically after the first week. We want to avoid iron in the first week of illness because if they have a bacterial infection and you give them iron, that bacterial infection tends to thrive on the iron and can worsen things. Malabsorptive syndromes like celiac disease, gastrectomy, which I already explained. Remember, you are removing that acid and the stomach is producing less acid. So it means that the iron is no longer going to be in the ferrous form, but rather going to be in the ferric form, which is quite difficult to absorb. It could be due to chronic bleeding for adults between 20 to 50 years, peptic ulcer disease in males, menorrhagia in females, and even pregnancy. You decide to get pregnant every other year. You don't give your chance, your body a chance to actually recover. You could have some GIT problems like esophageal viruses, hyades or hernias, mm -hmm. peptic ulcer disease, aspiration, ingestion, or aspirin rather, ingestion. Remember, this causes GIT bleeding. You could have carcinomas of the stomach, which could be bleeding, the cecum, the colon, and the rectum, hookworm infestations, the ankylostoma duodenale and Ecata americanus, the hookworms. You make sure you get dewormed if you are suspecting to have some worm infestation. You may have schistosomiasis infection, colitis, piles, which are hemorrhoids, diverticulosis. Rarely it could be hematuria, hemoglobinuria, pulmonary hemosiderosis, sometimes self-inflicted, someone who cuts themselves. Or it could be due to increased demand. Those that are premature in prematurity in newborn, remember you may have anemia of prematurity. In the adolescents that have this growth spurt, even in pregnancy, especially those pregnancies that are multiples, those twins, triplets, there is increased demand. Even just in a normal pregnancy, the iron demands are slightly higher compared to a non-pregnant woman. It could be decreased absorption, so those that have undergone a gastrectomy. So what are some of the clinical features patients will present with? Generally, they are going to be gradual and they're going to be progressive. So they're going to have the non-specific features of anemia. Things that we're going to talk about. So things like headaches, dizziness, palpitations, fainting, easy fatigability. These things are there in all kinds of anemia. So even if someone has macrocytic, normocytic, they'll have these features. They're not so specific to any specific type of anemia. But these ones that are specific to iron deficiency, you may have pica, where they have this craving for these unusual food substances like Amyelophagia, geophagia, pycophagia. Sometimes they may even be craving things like ice. They crave things like dirt that don't have any nutritional value. They can have brittle nails. They have also coelonychia, which are spoon-shaped nails. I do show you a picture in the next slide. They could have the atrophy of the papillae. So right now, if you feel your tongue, it feels to have those bumps, assuming you don't have iron deficiency. But sometimes the tongue becomes smooth. It enlarges. We call that as atrophic glossitis. You may have brittle hair as well. You may have these ulcers at the corner of the mouth, which we call angular stomach. And in some cases, you may have a triad of three things. You have iron deficiency anemia, you have esophageal, an esophageal web that may be causing dysphagia, and you have atrophic glossitis. We call that as the Plummer Vincent syndrome, also referred to as the Patson Kelly syndrome. So remember that the diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia should heavily rely on your clinical history. Take a good history, a dietary history, how much food they're, they're taking, the types of food that they're taking. Are they on any medications like NSAs that can cause GI bleeding? Do they have any blood in the stool? Maybe this is a sign of hemorrhoids. Maybe it's a sign of the carcinoma of the bowel. In women, you should take a good history of the menstrual periods. What are the periods like? What is the duration? Do they have any blood clots? How many pads are they changing? Normally, are they changing three to five or more than that? This is what coelonychia looks like, as you can see, spoon-shaped nails. In terms of investigations, you want to do a full blood count. Of course, your MCV will be low, less than 80. Your MCH and your MCHC will also be low, so they'll be microcytic, small cells, and hypochromic. They are less pink than usual. You may have this pencil-shaped cells, and different shaped red blood cells, we call that as poikilocytosis. You may have codocytes or target cells, or you may have different sizes and shapes, we call that as anisocytosis. Now remember one important thing that is going to point you towards iron deficiency, you can do what is known as iron studies. So in terms of iron studies, let's now go through the parameters that we have. We have serum iron, which measures the amount of iron in your bloodstream. Normally it should be about 13 to 32 um, units. So generally, if someone has an iron deficiency, they don't have iron in their bloodstream. So you would expect that their serum iron to decrease. And remember, if the serum iron is low, it means your body is now thinking, I'm in a deficiency. I need to make more proteins that are meant to bind 
to ion. And remember that these proteins are transferring molecules and the total number of these transferring molecules, we call that as the total ion binding capacity. So generally you make more transferring molecules so your ion binding capacity will increase. So you have an increase in the total ion binding capacity. Then remember each of these transferring molecules normally should bind to um, two atoms of, uh, ferric, acid, of uh, ferric ion and in essence three transferring molecules um, or normally the, the total, the percentage saturation rather is about 33%, meaning that if you have three of them, three transferring molecules, one of them will be bound to iron. So generally you have less iron that's there. So the percentage is also going to reduce. So your such percentage saturation of this transferring will be less than 18%. So generally you're going to have a decrease in the serum ion, a decrease in the ferritin, an increase in the total ion binding capacity, a decrease in the percentage saturation, and you have an increase in the free erythrocyte protoporphyrin because of the early phase of iron deficiency anemia. Other investigations are going to be aimed towards looking at an underlying cause. So you could do STU for occult blood, STU for ovine parasites. Occult blood checks if they're bleeding, ovine parasites to check for those hookworm infestations. You could have a chest x-ray for excluding pulmonary hemosiderosis, urinalysis to check for hematuria or hemosidinuria, pelvic studies, like for example, a pelvic ultrasound to check maybe it's fibroids that is causing them to continuously bleed or other gynecological problems. You can also consider upper and lower GIT radiological and even endoscopic studies as well as a bronchoscopy in some cases. This is what the target cells look like. As you can see, they look like a target and here you have poikilocytosis. Last but not least, how do we manage these patients that have iron deficiency? You want to treat the underlying cause. The ultimate treatment will depend on the severity of the condition. Those that are symptomatic, you want to admit them and transfuse them with blood while you address the underlying cause, investigate them adequately. Those that are asymptomatic and have moderate to mild anemia, you can actually have some time to buy. You can give them some oral uh, replacement. So often we give the oral replacement with either the ferrous sulfate or the ferrous gluconate. Generally, the ferrous gluconate is much more tolerated than the ferrous sulfate. The ferrous sulfate causes a lot of GI abscess. It causes some nausea, dyspepsia, even some constipation and diarrhea. So in terms of ferrous sulfate, we give 200 milligrams three times a day. That This gives about 180 milligrams of ferrous ion, while as ferrous gluconate, we give 300 milligrams um, twice a day which gives about 70 milligrams of iron. And remember, they must take this for an extended period. So they must take it even up to six months to replenish the stores, actually. So treatment must be continued as you check the HB and you continue until it re the anemia resolves. And sometimes remember that your rise in HB is going to be about 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 grams per deciliter. So generally, you get an increase in the HB concentration of at least two grams per deciliter after three weeks of treatment. You consider this as a good response. So they continue for three months after the symptoms of anemia and have resolved after this so that you can replenish the stores. So remember, if they continue bleeding, if they're not compliant, if it's a wrong diagnosis, if there's a mixed deficiency, for example, they have concomitant folic acid or vitamin B12 deficiency, or they have another type of anemia, another cause of the anemia, like a malignancy or an inflammation that hasn't been addressed, or they have a malabsorption, then generally all these are the things that may actually cause inadequate response to treatment. In some cases, we may consider parenteral iron for those that cannot tolerate oral iron. So these ones can actually be given. For those that have malabsorption, the iron sucrose can be given, iron sorbitol, iron dextran uh, complex. So the dose is really calculated as shown by the formula displayed on your screen. Not so important that you should memorize this formula really. I really hope you enjoyed this video on iron deficiency anemia. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.